Um, well, I will speak about the coin uh, production uh, related finds uh, from medieval Lund. Uh, well, uh, Lund is not in Denmark, as you might know. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Cecilia and uh, Gita has already spoken about that, but just a brief overview of where Lund is compared to modern Denmark. This is modern Denmark. This is medieval Denmark. Medieval Denmark has grown smaller to become modern Denmark. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, part of uh, the southern Jutland, South Schleswig, uh, became German, and um, in where does that come from? That, that's better. Um, and in the 17th century, um, Eastern Denmark became Southern Sweden, and Lund is exactly in that area. Lund is a very important city. You can see where it was compared to medieval Denmark and compared to uh, present-day Denmark. Uh, not very far from Copenhagen, but still a foreign country. Um, the Cathedral of Lund was the uh, Archbishop of uh, whole Denmark, so it's not just another Danish medieval city, it was a very important Danish city at that time. And uh, you can even see that in the uh, preserved uh, houses and buildings in Lund. Here's a very nice uh, 16th century brick building in the main street of Lund, uh, going back to the Danish period, showing that, well, for people from Central Europe, this is nothing, but for people from Scandinavia, this is really a wow house from, uh, from the 16th century. So showing it was really an important city in medieval Denmark. It was also an important mint in medieval Denmark. I will not go very much into that because that would be a lecture in itself. I have uh, stolen a few photos from the internet just to show you that there was a continuous uh, striking of coins from the last uh, years of the 990s up to the early 15th century. And during uh, long periods, Lund was indeed the most important mint in, uh, in the Danish uh, realm. Um, this is just to show you some examples of that to put the setting. So, uh, what will I talk about today? Uh, speaking about uh, where the minting took place, speaking about uh, the minting techniques and so on. What kind of sources do we have for that? Well, the written sources are not very prolific on uh, um, mint striking, coin striking in, in Lund. Uh, we just know from very late sources that uh, a plot in the city uh, marked with a, a green star uh, in the 16th century was reputed of being the, the uh, minter's um, uh, premises, and at that time there was no coin striking any longer in, uh, in Lund, so it must be a historical name, and we think that this is where uh, coinage was struck during the last period uh, of striking in Lund uh, in the uh, early uh, 15th century. Uh, so, uh, that is pretty much established that that was where the minting took place at that time. For the previous periods, we do not have exact knowledge about uh, where the coinage took place. Uh, we do not have, well, the nice excavated mints as we have in other Scandinavian and European cities. Uh, as I just said, we do not have uh, written sources about that. Uh, but Lund is a city. Uh, it's not only the, uh, well, an important city uh, for medieval Denmark after it became Swedish. It also became the intellectual center of southern Sweden because uh, the Swedes uh, founded a university in Lund to uh, compete with the University of Copenhagen. So Scanians didn't go over there to Copenhagen, but stayed in, in, in Sweden and uh, got uh, taught there. So there's a very long tradition of intellectual and academic life in, in Lund, and also 
a long-standing uh, record of uh, archaeological excavations in the uh, urban city center of uh, Lund, uh, going back uh, more than a century, uh, mainly thanks to the um, the uh, um, archaeological unit of the local museum, uh, Kulturen. So there are very many finds from Lund, and uh, many of them can be related to coinage. Uh, it's, well, some of them are related to coinage for certain. You'll see some of them a little bit later in the lecture. And some of them are related to coinage on a more hypothetical uh, level. Uh, and what I will do is to do a short review on that. Uh, it's mainly drawing on the research of other people that I'm resuming, uh, taking from literature. Uh, and I'll try to show what that can tell us about um, the organization of coinage, coinage striking, the social standing of, uh, of the um, coin production within the city, and a little bit about techniques. Of course, it will only be glimpses because we don't have the fully excavated uh, mint worker shop, uh, but uh, I think that even this, those glimpses will be of interest. This is the first item. Um, I've shown with a, a red circle where in Lund it is found, uh, very near to the city center. Uh, it is uh, a lid uh, for um, a drawer for pencils. Um, the, the, the box where the pencils and the pens and so on were in is not preserved, but this lid was found. Uh, you see it's, it's nicely carved, it's in wood, it's a little bit more than 20 centimeters length to give you an idea about the, the size. Uh, and it was found in uh, this excavation um, some uh, 45 years ago. Um, what has it to do with, with, with coinage? Well, uh, as you see at the, um, at the lid, at the inner side of the lid, uh, there's a name, Leofwin, uh, and below there's uh, more letters uh, beginning with an M. Some people has written it as Minterer, which means Minter. So that would be pretty sure that it is uh, Minter's uh, signature, but otherwise it has been written as Me Fekit, uh, Did Me. Uh, so, um, well, uh, unfortunately, the reading of this uh, last word is not secure. Uh, but the other reason for assigning it to, uh, to mint production is that Leofwin is a very uh, common name found on the reverses of the coin struck in Lund in the uh, 11th century. Uh, so it would be logical to think what could, the link could be made that this uh, was really the property of the mentor Leofwin. More so that Leofwin is an Anglo-Saxon name, and we know that very many of the moneyers were uh, Anglo-Saxons coming in as experts to uh, Scandinavia to help uh, starting the uh, coinage. The style of this uh, object is in the Winchester Ringerige uh, mixture style, which was typical for, for Anglo. Uh, Scandinavian England uh, in the uh, first half of the 11th century. The lid was found, it is where, it's marked with a little P, can I show it here? A little P next to a well, do you see it? No, it doesn't, yeah, here, next to a well, and then Yes, next to the well it was found. Um, in a, a context of the 11th century. And this is uh, how um, the archaeologists of Lund uh, imagine that it could have been used. You can use the inner part of it with wax to write on it. And the mint master is uh, counting the coins that his his uh, workman has done. Uh, this object was found in the excavation. This coom was found. This brooch was found. Uh, this chair was found. Uh, this applique was found that may have been from uh, 
uh, a drinking gear may have been for something else, but this is what the archaeologists of Lund imagine that the situation could have been when the Minder used uh, this object. The next one is a walking stick found a little bit further to the south. Uh, this is just the top of it, the carved top of it. It was, uh, of course, a lot longer and used as a walking stick. Um, the name Ulkil was written a little bit further down on it, um, halfway down on this walking stick in runes. And uh, Ulkil is also uh, a very well-known uh, Minter's name uh, from the coins, written on the coins uh, uh, as it was the habit to do in Lund in, um, in the 11th century, taking up the English habit of writing the name of the Minter and the name of the Mint uh, on, the, um, on the coins. This is also uh, um, an object in this Rinkerige Winchester style. Uh, so it may very well be uh, English influence, once again, Anglo-Saxon influence. Ulkil is a Scandinavian name, but curiously much more common in the Dane law, in the uh, Viking influence parts of England than in Scandinavia. So once again, this may be linked to, uh, to an Anglo-Scandinavian uh, context which is appropriate for, 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 for the social milieu of the Minters. Uh, but of course, there could have been other Ulkils in Lund. We cannot establish beyond a doubt that this was really the Minter, the Mint Master Ulkil. It could have been another uh, Ulkil. Likewise, with this runic stone, uh, found in the late uh, 18th century, a little bit further south in the center of Lund. Uh, today, it is a few hundred meters away from here because the Bishop of Lund gave it as a present to the Bishop of uh, Copenhagen in the early uh, 19th century. And it is now um, put into the walls of the bishopric in, of Copenhagen a few hundred meters from here. So you can go up and see it uh, uh, after the lectures if you have the time and want to see it. The inscription tells that uh, Torge uh, paid for the construction of a church. Well, Torge likewise is a very well-known uh, Minter's name in Lund, so it may be the Minter Torge that was the one who paid for the church. Uh, but of course, we cannot be sure, and it can be any other toga uh, in Lund. But it has been suggested that it is the Minter, and uh, why not? So now we are getting to uh, items that are more securely related to, um, to minting. This is a trial piece in uh, lead. Uh, used for, for uh, impressions of coin dies, as you can see, a very clear one in the middle. You can even see the form of the die. And there have been several other impressions made into this piece of lead. These kind of, of items are uh, frequent uh, around Europe, and uh, often they are smaller than this one, but the principle is the same. You take um, a soft metal, often lead, and you, you make impressions into them. Uh, we don't know if it was to check if the, 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 if the um, um, stamp was okay or to clean them. But what is interesting about this one is that uh, as far as uh, Jörn Steen Jensen, who is present here, could see when he studied that uh, several years ago, all the impressions are made of the same die, and this die is not known from any known coins, uh, surviving coins. Uh, so maybe it has been used to, to, to check a die that uh, for some reason was uh, then discarded and not used. Um, it has also been suggested for similar items from other cities around Europe that it was a dye cleaner, that if the dye was, uh, 
was uh, somehow dirty, uh, you could uh, put it, print it into lead, and then, and then, it would be uh, the, um, uh, the the dirt would go away. So this is directly uh, linked to uh, minting. So we have all these persons. Uh, living in various places around the center of Lund. This is the places for the 11th century where archaeologists have shown that there would be uh, goldsmith activity. So maybe it's the same situation as in uh, Winchester, as has been suggested by Maria Sintio, that the coins took place at uh, various places at goldsmiths' uh, workshops. Uh, where they had their uh, workshop uh, goldsmith activity and also the minting activity. It is reasonable to, to think that. This is uh, how early Lund was. The uh, orange uh, spots are the very early period. Uh, the triangle, the red triangle, is the marketplace. And the, uh, the red stick is the, uh, where the, the, the Merchant Street developed. So uh, these places are fairly well situated around uh, this uh, central area of Lund. And then as a last uh, example uh, from the uh, 11th century, I will take uh, some very, very untypical graves with people being buried, uh, beheaded, and taking their, chopped their arms and, or their hands and their feet off has been excavated by Peter Carelli. And he suggested by comparing to Anglo-Saxon and uh, German uh, medieval laws and later Danish laws that this could be uh, fortress uh, that have been uh, chopped uh, and uh, sentenced and then uh, executed and then um, um, buried in a very, well, not very uh, conventional Christian way. Uh, I recommend you to read the article by Peter Carelli on that. That's very interesting. And the last thing about the 11th century is that there have been very many coin-like pendants found in uh, Lund. Uh, and here are where they were found, and they may have been a byproduct of the mint masters. They, they produce brass jewelry uh, with coin motifs. Then we go to the last period, uh, the later period, the 12th to the 14th century. Uh, there have been five dyes found. Uh, that is very many dyes. Uh, we have no, no such a concentration of medieval dyes in um, anywhere else in Scandinavia. There's one weight with a coin impression in it and uh, several planchets. The big circles are showing where the uh, weights and the dyes were found, very much concentrated near to the king's court, which was right next to the west of the cathedral and the market was it, it a mint shop that was linked to the market or the king's court? That is uh, difficult to say. Um, was it in the same place or at several places? That is difficult to say because these are isolated finds, but it, it's reasonable to think that it was in that area near to the king's court and the market. The small circles are planchets. They have not been studied uh, in details so it's hard to say if they're really linked to this period or another minting period, but I put them on the map anyway. And here are the uh, dyes uh, that have been found in Lund. Two of them are in the Historical Museum of the University of, uh, of Lund, where Gide is working. It's her responsibility, and the three others are in the uh, local history museum of uh, Kulturen. What is a little bit strange about four of these dyes are that they are just small uh, parts of the dye, and that has in been intriguing uh, people uh, for a long time. But when the, the one marked with B, uh, the, the long one, was found uh, and uh, studied, uh, among other peoples, by uh, Jörnstein Jensen sitting here, um, it was x-rayed and um, it was um, demonstrated that the lower two centimeters 
uh, and the rest of it was two separate parts that had been soldered together, the lower one being of harder material, harder uh, metal, and the upper one being of a softer material. So this means from a techni technological point of view, very interesting that uh, you could make a die, uh, just change the motif, uh, take this lower part off, and then add another one, smolder another one on it. Uh, and this is why the others look like they do. They are just parts of dyes that have not been uh, soldered onto uh, the part that you really need uh, to strike the coin. Um, this also means that all these parts can be either upper dyes or lower dyes. We cannot tell because the part that is either the upper die as this one on which you strike with the hammer or the lower die that you fix into a solid uh, base. Uh, these dies that are just partial dies can be soldered on any of them. Well, uh, that's about it. Yes. Thank you.